Hi and welcome. So this time around I'm sort of looking at an interesting project. Over the years I've been looking for ways to uh, put my name on my work and I started with something as simple as stickers and then I made this three-dimensional thing that you can cut slivers out of and uh, put them into the work and this turned out really well. Uh, then I got this stamp and this placard recently, these brass placards that are really fantastic. Um, what I've always wanted was a laser engraver that would work on metal. And unfortunately, those are priced way, way out there. Uh, an American made one is between 30 and 50,000. And even the Chinese ones are five to 6,000. And I'm not really willing to spend five to six grand on something that may not work and may not have any part availability. The uh, Chinese manufactured versions of fiber lasers, I just don't know if I could trust them at all. I don't know if the focus is good. I don't know if the lenses are good. There's so many unknowns. You put out all that money out there and you may get a lemon. So I've never been willing to take that leap. Uh, but I'm looking uh, uh, recently at yet another solution uh, to, to mark my work with my name, and that is engraving uh, metal etching. And I have found an interesting solution, watched several videos, and run across a company that makes some gear to do just that. Uh, their solution, they have the electronic equipment and the solutions, the chemical solutions, to help you etch metal. You can either do a dark coat that's permanent, uh, that looks sort of black, or you can do an etching that goes half a millimeter deep and then make it dark between switching between AC and DC voltage. So I'm going to buy the chemicals from them. I bought the uh, templates from them that they make and or stencils. And uh, I'm going to make the electronic equipment because that's pretty straightforward. Here's a selection of the basic parts I'm going to put together to make this uh, uh, engraving um, device. And uh, this is a case and some wire, a 24 volt center tap transformer happens to be 16 amps, which is a surprising amount of current. That I, we just had that at work that uh, was gonna be tossed. Some switches, some fuses, a whole full wave rectifier or a diode bridge, a, a capacitor that has a fairly high voltage, has 100 volts, 6,800 mics. And uh, we're going to put all this together and uh, we're still going to have to make the handpiece to do the, uh, the chemical etching, but uh, that'll come next. So uh, next set, step, I'm just going to assemble this and I won't do a lot of it on camera, uh, probably because it's not very advantageous to do that. I don't, but I will have schematics if you want to build your own and even a link to all the Amazon parts I used. Next up, I thought I'd cover the schematic diagram and explain how it works on sort of a basic level. Uh, but if you're not interested, go ahead and jump ahead and I show the actual hardware I made, uh, the power supply specifically, and just a little bit, a uh, quick look at the wiring inside. But uh, if you are interested, let's uh, start with the AC side over here. Here is your uh, home outlet in North America. Starting with the AC side first, a North American plug. We're 120, vo 120 volts AC, unlike the rest of the world, or most of the world, which is 240 volts uh, AC. Uh, we're 120 volts AC, which is slight a slight disadvantage to the rest of the world. And the main disadvantage is that we need much larger conductors to transfer the same amount of power to your end customer. Uh, because when you go from 120, vo 120 volts to 240 volts, the same amount of power can be delivered at half the current at 240 volts or 480 volts, one quarter the current. So we started really early with 120 volts and we just kind of got stuck there. So now it's hard to transition, but there is a big advantage to 240 volts in that uh, you can have much smaller conductors everywhere. So when you've got a nationwide uh, electrical system, you're actually saving a lot of copper there. Um, the disadvantage 240 volts is it's a bit more dangerous. Uh, you get a lot more current to flow with lower resistance, with a higher resistance. So uh, electrocutions become more of an issue. So it's sort of a trade-off. And 480 volts even more so. Uh, again, though, the advantage 480 volts, one quarter the current required to deliver the same amount of power because power equals current times voltage. So uh, voltage goes up, current goes down for the same amount of power. 
but let's get back to our plug. So the D-shaped uh, pin on our power, our wall outlet is ground. And if you had a metal case, if you were building this in a metal case, you should attach this lead to the outside of the case. Mine's plastic, so I don't have it attached. Then you have a hot and a neutral. Now in uh, US house wiring, in most cases, the neutral is tied at the box directly to this ground, to a ground lug in the soil. And so uh, these are very similar, except that you're not supposed to have current flowing in your ground leg and all the return current comes through the neutral. Uh, the small, the small uh, vertical spade, the small vertical slotted uh, pin is your hot and your larger one is your neutral. So out of the hot, uh, we go into a fuse and we, I chose a four amp fast blow fuse here, uh, which is a little bit large. Uh, it would have been better to have like a three and change amp uh, slow blow fuse. The difference between a slow blow and a fast blow is just basically what their name says. If you reach four amps, in a very, very short period of time, the fuse will open and disconnect the circuit at four amps. In a slow blow, it takes a much longer period of time. So uh, you can sort of get away with a higher current fast blow uh, to be more or less the equivalent of a lower current slow blow, not identical. Obviously, there are some differences there. Um, but I didn't have the slow blow, and so I chose a four amp fast blow fuse. Next in line is a switch, which is an on off for the entire box. And uh, th then it goes from there to the top of the transformer and out the bottom of the transformer back to the neutral so the current flows like this. In reality, it's AC, so it flows like this, then it flows like this, and it flows like this, and it flows like this. All right, on to the transformer. So the transformer is a pretty simple device. A transformer connects, basically changes the voltage on one side to a different voltage on the other side, and it does so by a ratio of turns. So if I have 10 turns on this side and one turn on this side, the voltage on this side will be one tenth the voltage on the other side. On the flip, if I have one amp on the 10 turn side, I will have 10 amps of capability on the one turn side because the inverse relationship with current is available. So as you step down the voltage, you step up the current. Uh, the specific transformer I am using is a 5 to 1 ratio transformer, so 120 volts in, 24 volts along the whole output. Uh, it's a center tap transformer, which means basically if I had 10 windings on this side, 5 windings in, I just attach a wire, which gives me uh, half the voltage of the overall. So this is actually two 12 volt sections on a 24 volt output of the transformer. Now. You gotta be really careful because if you're hooking the transformer up backwards and this ratio becomes one to five or one to 10, then if I put 110 volts in on this side, I will get 10 times or 1200 volts on the outside, which is very dangerous. So if you ever hook a transformer up backwards, it becomes, instead of a step down transformer, which is more common, it becomes a step up transformer and you can get in a lot of trouble with that. Uh, another uh, really good advantage of a transformer, which you don't get in a lot of modern switching supplies, some of them, but not all of them, is that you get galvanic isolation between the input and the output. And what I mean by that is, the current flowing in this side is never directly electrically coupled to the other side. It is magnetically coupled instead, which gives you isolation, uh, which can prevent some electrocution issues. Um, also, if you're ever attaching test equipment to a modern TV or some other piece of equipment, you need an isolation transformer on your test equipment because otherwise the ground on your test equipment, when you attach it over here, you're actually, you're, since this is electrically actually coupled in a switching supply, you will actually be attaching your hot straight to ground and you'll short through your test equipment, very common with oscilloscopes. And that's probably more information than you wanna know. Just know that transformers, although big and bulky and less efficient than a lot of switching supplies, um, do provide some isolation between one side and the other because this other side is essentially floating. Uh, no reference to this ground whatsoever unless you happen to attach them, uh, which they are not. All right, so the transformer on this side uh, we take one output of this transformer, and we call it our common, and that will just flow right through this switch if it's in AC mode, right to your output, and it's just our common AC output right here, as you can see. Then the center tap of the transformer on the secondary side goes to one leg of a switch, and that voltage between here and here is only half the windings of here to here, so its voltage is half, therefore 12 volts. 
And so that goes to one side of the switch. The whole number of windings, the output, goes to the other side of the switch, which allows you to choose between 12 volts here, 24 volts here. And in the AC mode, that output goes through this switch and comes out the other leg. So you've got AC here, either 12 or 24 volts, when this switch is on this side. When the switch is on the other side, you get DC. Uh, this power supply was broken up into two parts for a reason. <clears throat> uh, when you're in AC mode, it tends to give a darker but not very deep etch. And when you're in DC mode, you're supposedly able to get a deep etch up to maybe half a millimeter. Uh, so that's why the DC side, which we're gonna look at next. All right, so the same two AC outputs that continue on, on their way to the output in AC mode, if the switch is flipped over here, those contacts are open, but they come down here to a diode bridge. And a diode bridge's job is to convert AC into pulsating DC. And the way that works is that these devices only conduct in one direction. So AC is a symmetrical signal and our output AC here is either 12 or 24 volts. Let's go with 24 volts. So this is plus 24 volts, minus 24 volts. And the center here is zero as a reference. And so these only conduct in one direction. So when this side is positive, this diode conducts and it comes out the positive side. This side conducts through this diode and goes to the negative side. So you see how that works. So your positive goes through here out, negative comes up through here and out. When that voltage flips to this direction, so that negative is over here and positive is over here, the negative comes down this leg out here, out the negative side, and the positive comes up here through this, out the positive side. What this device does, it converts AC and it converts it to pulsating DC and that this sinusoid keeps going infinitely. And so you end up with a pulsating DC signal roughly at 24 volts on the output. Now, in reality, this voltage, all these voltages, 120 volts, 12 volts, 24 volts on the AC side are all known as the RMS value or root mean square value. So in reality, their peaks are somewhat higher. So uh, in reality, this is actually slightly higher than 24 volts, and that'll become very important in a really short while. So next, after it comes out of the diode bridge, you've got pulsating DC like this. That actually goes all the way to zero and then back up again. Uh, and then it comes across a capacitor, and a capacitor is sort of like a battery storage device, uh, except that it doesn't use electrochemical storage, it uses charge storage. So when the electrons get pumped into it, a bunch of electrons accumulate on one side, it attracts a bunch of uh, lack of electrons or holes on the other side, and it builds up a bunch of charge across the plates. And what that ends up doing is this pulsating DC on the output as the capacitor charges up to peak and then the voltage starts to sag on the other side, the capacitor starts feeding current back into the circuit, which tends to prop the voltage up. And so it looks like this. And so what you end up with on your output is, is something that looks a lot closer to a straight line DC signal on the output. Now, remember when I was talking about this root mean square value? Well, when you prop up the voltage with the capacitor on the output, uh, the output comes a lot closer to the peak value, which is greater than this RMS value. And where that comes into play is that you see I chose a 6800 microfarad 100 volt capacitor. Um, with capacitors, physical size of the capacitor tends to be related uh, directly related to number one, the value of the capacitor. So the larger the value of the capacitor, the larger the physical size of the capacitor, and the less droop this will have. So this angle, depending on how much current you're drawing on the output, the lower the value capacitor, it'll droop more. The larger value capacitor will prop up the signal more, and it'll be more and more flat. Uh, also, the breakdown voltage of the capacitor. So the dielectric in between here, um, over a certain voltage, it will arc through. And when it does that, the capacitor fails and it shorts your input to your output. So the rating of this capacitor that I chose is 100 volts. Um, if you exceed 100 volts, it'll shorten, the capacitor can be ruined. Uh, 
Um, so the larger this uh, breakdown voltage, the larger the physical size, the size of the capacitor. So, I mean, why wouldn't everyone just choose the highest value capacitor and the largest breakdown voltage? Well, usually size is a constraint. Now, coming back to the RMS thing, the peak voltage on the output of this is actually something around uh, 1.4 times this voltage, which puts it at 30 some volts. So if you chose a 24 volt breakdown capacitor on your output thinking, I'm only using maximum 24 volts anyways, um, you, would, you would immediately have the capacitor start to break down uh, because the peak curve voltage is higher than that. Even if I went to 50 volts, it would be under the most likely around 30 some volts, low 30 volts uh, on the output, but that's only a two to one ratio and it's a little less than two to one. If you ever had a surge on the input, which would be translated to the output, um, you could again exceed that capacitor and over time break it down. So I tend to choose four times just as a safety margin. So I chose 100 volts, uh, which is actually closer to three time margin in this specific case. So once you've got the DC on the output of the capacitor, the positive goes up to here, and the negative comes up to here. And when you flip these switches to this side, it takes both output contacts and connects them to the DC side, and you've got DC negative up here and DC positive down here. Down here. And so that's the power supply in a nutshell. Um, this is called a linear supply. Um, if you wanted to make this less ripply on the output, you could either add more capacitors or you could put a regulator in there. And uh, we won't go into the details on that, but if anyone has questions, you can always uh, email me or text me and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, so this is the power supply sort of recommended by the, uh, the, the industry standard for this metal etching. I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but this is 12 and 24 volts seem to be the common volts, probably based on a bit of safety measure and a bit, a bit of convenience of getting high currents on the output. Um, I think you can need like five to 10 amps. Uh, the company, the TUS uh, systems that I bought the electrolytes from uh, also make power supplies and they also have 12 and 24 volt power supplies. So I copied them. Now maybe at some point, See, we have 60 hertz here on the output, right? Even in AC mode, maybe the uh, frequency, uh, changing the frequency will improve the etching. So maybe at some point, I'll switch this out to a DC supply and then create a modulating circuit that makes pulsating DC on the output uh, or actually AC on the output uh, adjustable frequency because maybe 400 hertz is better. I don't actually know. Um, so if I ever get into that, uh, that's a possibility for the future. This is just taking advantage of the line frequency of 60 hertz, so you really don't have another easy way to uh, change that. All right, so here's the power supply I built. It's a uh, quick and dirty using relatively inexpensive switches. This uh, final output switch is three position with the center being off. Uh, here's that on off I was telling you in the very beginning. Uh, 12 and 24, this is the center tap of the transformer here or the whole output of the transformer here. Uh, this is straight from the output of this switch out through these wires and on the bottom here goes through the bridge and the capacitor and you can see inside I still have to uh, connect the capacitor. Like I said this was all uh, quickly thrown together as a uh, test case because I'm still not convinced that 60 cycles is the best frequency for AC. I might very well want higher frequencies that may do a better job, but I don't know. And I won't know until I test this guy out. So for now, this is just all temp together. Everything is safe, but uh, temp together. So there's the bridge down there, the big transformer here. Here's my inline fuse and uh, and the switches and it's all pretty straightforward. The wire I used in here is all uh, 12 or 14 gauge because I'll, they're very short lengths but uh, want 14 amps of uh, current or 16 amps of current potentially. Although I'm not sure the dielectric is going to conduct that well. I played around with just salt water and salt water unless you make it really strong is it only allows like less than an amp of current to flow so that's not anywhere near uh, going to stress this transformer. I think the ones they sell commercially are actually something like 10 or 15 amps. So maybe the dielectric solutions that I bought from Tusk Technologies uh, will be lower impedance or lower resistance than this. I bought several of theirs. I bought 9B number 10 and EXD20. Uh, Tusk Technologies makes a uh, etching uh, power supply as well. 
uh, two versions. One's uh, simple like this one and one's more complicated, uh, which is what makes me think maybe uh, pulse duration matters. Um, so we'll, we might play with that in the future. Um, and I tried their, they have more electrites and they'll make custom ones specific for your needs. Plus, they also make the templates, uh, you have to pay them for it, uh, that you can use to etch whatever shapes you want onto the surface of the metal. And uh, we have here, I had three different sizes of my, my emblem made just to try them out. So this material, we'll look at it through a magnifying glass, uh, but it's transparent. Uh, you can, and I think it must be some sort of fine mesh because you got to let the fluid get through there. But this part here is non-conductive. Here's what the template looks like up close. So it is a mesh with silicone on it or something like that. Uh, allows the electrolyte go through, but where the silicon in the brown areas are, uh, doesn't let the liquid go through. And they get surprisingly good edges with the right electrolyte solution. So uh, definitely worth the time to get their templates. They have the make your own template material that you can get from them that works really well so too. Three different sizes for depending on what project I'm doing, I can put my initials on it. I just thought that'd be fun. It's always fun to sort of market yourself and your channel. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't actively do much of it beyond this, but I think it's fun to put my names on parts that I've spent a long time working on. Um, so that's pretty much the power supply. And uh, like I said, uh, I am gonna neaten it up a bit once I decide on the final design and I'm gonna do something better than just these stickers. They were just quick and dirty uh, to get my, uh, to, to get this working so I could test this out because I'm not even sure how well this works. This is all a big experiment. Um, this is the ground side and I put an alligator clip on it. I really want a bigger alligator clip. Um, I might, uh, find some way of repurposing one of these guys uh, to clip on whatever it is you want to do. I'll obviously, I have to take the insulator off the end there. By the way, the voltages here are very low. They're not risky. So you're not really uh, risking electrocuting yourself. But if you don't know what you're doing, like for example, you get the transformer backwards and put the uh, 24 volt uh, side on the 110. And the, the 110 side will now be approximately four, almost five times higher. That'll be 500 volts on the output. Could be very dangerous. So if you don't know what you're doing, don't attempt a project like this because it can be very dangerous. If you get a transformer in backwards, it'll step the voltage up rather than step it, step it down. Um, this side is a banana, uh, the positive side, which goes on top of the template. And so what I need to build, I've got this Delrin here, is a device for applying the voltage uh, and the electrolyte. So what I'm going to do is I am going to drill a hole through this piece and I am going to put an aluminum rod that the banana jack will fit into for the probe on the one side. The banana jack lets me make multiple different probes if this one doesn't work out very well. Uh, maybe you want smaller faces on them. I don't know, maybe that's a good thing too. We will see. Uh, so I'm gonna have a piece of aluminum going all the way through this. Uh, with a hole for the banana jack on the back. The front will have an aluminum plate and on top of the aluminum plate will go some felt. And uh, you can buy that at McMaster Car, you can buy it at Amazon. Um, I've got some thin felt, maybe I'll want some thicker felt in the future. Uh, and then to hold the felt in place, so the felt's gonna fit over the side here, I am going to make a ring that slides down over the top of this to hold the felt in place. So I gotta make these parts and that's what's next and then we'll try this out. I have a piece, a fairly short piece of Delrin. It's like two and a half inches long uh, loaded in here. And we're just gonna drill and ream for 0.373, which is 2 thousandths under 0.375, but I figure it's plastic, so it should stretch. I want an interference fit for the aluminum, so. This is pretty straightforward. This is uh, one size under 0.375 on the 3 eighths on the fractional. That'll give room for some weld bead buildup. Even though the reamer was pretty sharp, the plastic still stretched around it a bit. So 0.373 was way too tight. So here is 0.375 on the money and that's still really tight. So I think that'll be perfect. It's not like there's gonna be any force on trying to pull it out because the aluminum plate's gonna be here, pushing on the rod 
in the back, so there's really not much in the way of any risk at all. This is the uh, core aluminum rod that'll be the conductor from the back to the front, and we're gonna drill the hole for the banana plug. So. Just the test fit, see how tight it is. Oh yeah, that's a good fit. I just wanna make sure it was a good, so here's the piece that'll go inside. This side's chamfered so I can weld it uh, flush. So now I've got to get some one inch stock and I've got to cut off a wafer, but first I've got to pre-drill the end for three eighths of an inch so that it can slide over this piece and then weld it on. Um, I didn't know if I was gonna put weld in back or front. I think I'm gonna put weld in the front and sand it flat. Um, but I did uh, relieve the Delrin so that if I decided to, I could always relieve, I put the weldment on the back. The stock is larger than one inch, but we're gonna start by drilling a .375 hole in it. Throw on a chamfer, because that'll just make it easier to weld and give it more uh, surface area to, for the weld to come in contact with. Taking the one inch stock down to the diameter, final diameter. So I made the part a little undersized, and now I'm just parting it off. Now without lube, you get some welding on the inserts, especially this high speed. You gotta take a, aggressive bites. All right, so here's the two pieces. And uh, this is the back side. Here's the front side that's chamfered along with the chamfered part here. And I'm just going to press this piece into here. I just used a 3 8 inch drill and it's very tight, which is nice. So I welded this part on, I faced it off, and then just gave it a quick polish on the uh, Scotch-Brite wheel. Just really quick. So I'm going to press this side into here. I think next time I'd go flush with the, uh, the, part, the uh, aluminum on the outside and weld from the back, because this relief will uh, take care of that. So I'm just going to go to the Arbor Press and press this guy in. Here are the parts combined. And uh, that's where the banana goes. I made the aluminum but like two or three thousandths smaller than the diameter of the uh, Delrin. And next up, we're gonna make just a ring to hold the felt on. I bored this out to one inch 90 thousandths. I'm just gonna relieve some sharp edges. The outside less important than the inside. There's my ring. I just need to take the burr off the other side. So I, uh, I just cut a little bit of relief out of here to make it easier to push down. Reduce the amount of friction. It only needs to be held in four corners. Didn't do a very good job cutting that. But uh, pretty much center this over here. Get the beveled side of this guy down. And just press this on, which I made a kind of a tight fit, which is both good and bad. I've got a variety of materials here we can test this on, and I did a little bit of playing off camera. We're going to start with some aluminum here, and to be honest, none of the solutions are particularly good at aluminum. Uh, the best is this EX10, uh, but it still isn't great with aluminum. They apparently have another one that is something like, uh, what is it called? It's weird that they didn't show on their available items for sale, uh, but aluminum wants EX4 for deep etching, and... Uh, uh, apparently, it'll also work with 9 or 10B, but uh, in experimenting off camera, I didn't have great luck with that. But we're going to start with the Electrolyte 10 here. And we're going to start with 24 volts AC. And that will allow us to uh, mark it. So AC uh, supposedly marks dark. DC supposedly etches deeply, uh, but this Electrolyte solution is not supposedly very good for etching deeply. Um, so a bunch of short passes. A 
So they said lots of short passes is better than one long pass because you can damage the uh, the template, which I did on the, my experimental one here. It was one of the big ones. You can see the, the there's some damage to the silicone, I think silicone, uh, on the edges. So what happens is it lets the fluid bleed underneath it so you don't get crisp, uh, crisp etches. Oh, actually, that turned out all right. It's not dark colored. Uh, but uh, very, very legible light color, if you can see that. Trying to get this visible on camera is a little bit of a challenge. So that was like four or five passes. That's actually very respectable and a nice looking, uh, nice looking etch. Let's see if I can. So also, you don't want to leave the etchant on uh, after you need to wash these things. Uh, I didn't do that on some of my other examples, and they ended up uh, uh, damaging the material. Actually, that's, uh, that's very respectable for fast. Let's do a couple more passes just to see if we can do it better. Actually, we can go for some D depth here, flip it to DC, but I don't think that's going to work because, uh, as I was saying, this is the wrong solution for this, and I don't really have the right one. Also, the felt, uh, uh, the saw, I think it needs to be denser felt than I used, and so that may make a difference as well. So a couple more passes, and it doesn't look like it went a lot deeper, but it is a very, very clean etch. I'm, I'm pleased with the results on that. This is just alcohol that I'm cleaning this off with, 70%, so there's some water in it. I think that's respectable. Let's move on to the next material. Next up is a chunk of carbon steel. Uh, it's mild steel, actually. And we're going to do it on 24 volts AC. One, two, three, four, five, like half second passes. And again, a very clean etch. It's not particularly dark. So let's try a couple more passes. Sometimes the solution doesn't get underneath as quickly. I've got a tape down on one side and I'm dragging against the tape so to keep this flat on the surface. And this steel uh, probably would work better if it was uh, polished first, but I didn't do that. Oh, there we go. That's a pretty darn good, uh, pretty darn good marking there. Let's uh, take off the template. So sometimes some of the etching uh, material comes off after, but uh, that's very legible and respectable. You can even feel that a little bit. So that's good. I'm pleased with that one too. That's uh, carbon steel, aluminum. Uh, I'm sorry, mild steel and aluminum. I'll get it right eventually. Here's some carbon steel. This is spring steel. This is like 1095, something like that. And, uh, you know, let me go scotch bright this real quick and I'll bring it back just to give a cleaner surface. All right, so here we are with some steel, uh, carbon steel, uh, 1095 spring steel, I think it is. I've uh, cleaned it off with some scotch bright. Uh, it's very important that the material be clean if you want a clean etch and the surface should be flat. So something to definitely keep in mind. All right, so there's uh, four or five passes. And I would say that's the best result. Yeah, look at that one. That's pretty fantastic. So my last sample here is stainless steel, and that does have a different electrolyte. That's the 10, EX10 electrolyte. So I'm gonna switch off real quick and I'll be right back. When I change electrolytes, I change pads on this guy because uh, the other one's saturated with the other electrolyte, and I don't know what difference it makes. Notice that uh, the aluminum may be a bad choice. I mean, I think all metals would get degraded because if you're etching one direction, there's no reason it wouldn't etch this direction either. Uh, but the aluminum gets pretty badly uh, etched, as you can see here, from my just my little bit of practicing. So we're going to go with material number 10. I did number these so that I could put them back on the right material. I'll be honest with you, this is my second time shooting this because I was so busy experimenting, I wasn't really explaining what I was doing well the first time. So I thought I'd come back and do a better job. <clears throat> Next time, make this ring a little bigger. 
because it's hard to get on there plus this stuff gets really crunchy after its first use all right so stainless let me clean the old electrolyte off of here these stencils are supposedly good for approximately what did they say um 5, 000, uh, 5, 000 etchings so uh, clearly i didn't get anything close to that out of this one but i held the probe on it for like 30 seconds and, it, and you could see the water boil the electrolyte boiling and i think it damaged it that was uh, my not following instructions and paying the price okay oh we're on nothing let's go to ac I've done all of these on AC24 so far because I had really poor luck with DC. I didn't get any penetration whatsoever. Uh, and it might have been something I'm doing, um, but there's also a special electrolyte, which apparently I don't have for deep penetration. And uh, uh, there's the stainless. So let me clean it off because I noticed with the stainless, some of the black comes off when you clean it. Oh, that actually did a really good job. I don't know if you can see that. All right, so the stainless worked. And just one more visit with the brass with the same uh, same material here. I, again, it's not the right electrolyte they specify in their uh, reference sheet, but this one's for exotic metals that include nickel. Doesn't mean it'll work on brass at all, but we're gonna give it a shot. Oh wow, that actually did a really, really good job. And it left copper in its wake. So it took out, I think brass is zinc and copper, and it took the zinc out. Look at that, that is gorgeous. It left a brass <laughs> mark on it instead. That is absolutely fantastic, that was unexpected. So apparently this solution, the EX10 solution, designed for chrome and things like that, also will leach out the zinc out of the brass and leave just copper, which is a fantastic contrast. I, uh, I'm going to have to remember that one. Uh, that was pretty uh, pretty good experience, and I learned a lot. So I hope you find it useful. By the way, you can also, if the etching solution is hard to come by, you can also use uh, table salt or um, even 50-50 uh, uh, salt substitute, which is potassium chloride with sodium chloride. They also work. They don't tend to work as well. Uh, they tend to create a lot less sharp lines, but they do work. So uh, anyways... I think it's I think it's a pretty good big success. The uh, etching device seems to work. The power supply works. This holder works. I think I would uh, change the electrode material from aluminum because you can see how badly irritated, uh, uh, abraded it gets or etched it gets. And uh, I think that's about it. I think overall it was a success. I did a couple other things with bigger templates earlier, like there. That was after doing DC. Um, these are with bigger templates. I started on DC, so I ruined my template right off the bat. Here were some experiments on this aluminum right here. That was a deep etch. And uh, this was table salt. You can see that it's not very, uh, not very clean lines at all. So I don't think that's the best solution. But anyways, learned a bunch. Thanks for watching. Hope you find it useful. Hope to see you next time.